I'll admit, when I first popped in Inherent Vice into my DVD player, I was expecting a farce or a romp to get me laughing about a drugged out hippie conducting an investigation. The trailers made the film seem more comical than dramatic. Whoa. Are you alright? Am I? Are you? Ordinarily, we're the ones asking the questions. And your question is, which side am I on? Good question. Wrong answer. <laughs> The trailer really undersold the drama in the film, liking it to like a Big Lebowski or a Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. After two and a half hours of me trying to grasp what in the actual hell is going on, I thought it was my small attention span that ruined my understanding of the film. A quick look up online told me that I was actually wrong. It stars Joaquin Phoenix as a hippie private investigator in Los Angeles, trying to solve the mystery of what this film's plot is. Mike, what did you think of Inherent Vice? Jay, do you remember a time when you could understand what Paul Thomas Anderson movies were about? I was determined to follow the film even if it meant re-watching it all over again. I don't read much, but I figured now would be a great time more than ever to sign up for a free trial at Audible. This is not an actual sponsorship. Check out Thomas Pinchon's novel of the same name from my local library and begin my journey into the hippie world of 1970s California. Like the film, the book detours into various cases at one time, throwing name after name that I had to either remember everyone or create a board tying people's names with thin red yarn. Now finishing up the book and rewatching the film for the umpteenth time, I was able to figure out what was actually happening. Better yet, I found a deeper meaning. Inherent Vice isn't about a dope fiend trying to find his XO lady Shasta, nor is it about the case itself. Inherent Vice is a metaphor for the loss of a loved one and how that grief manifests itself in our minds. <laughs> Okay, okay, just hear me out for just a second. Pinchon's novel is convoluted, and the adaptation by Paul Thomas Anderson does a fantastic job of recreating that convolutedness, as well as bringing over the deeper meaning. While I will be talking almost exclusively about the film, I will be talking about the book as well, and how it differs slightly from the film itself. Warning! If you have not seen the film or read the book, spoilers are abound. According to Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's motto on grief, there are five stages. Depression, anger, denial, bargaining, and acceptance. If you've been around as long as I have, or been on the internet for as long as I have, you may have seen the robot chicken skit with this giraffe. Uh-oh. It's the same principle I'm applying to the film. Doc Sportello, played by Joaquin Phoenix, being the heavy drug user he is, suffers from the inability to distinguish from reality and hallucinations, something he copes with when talking with his clients. We don't know if what we see him see is real or not, but we can assume that most of what he sees are figments of his psychosis state. Chalk that up to him being high all the time, but it could be something else. I'm going to fly through every step in the Kubler-Ross's model. Doc's goal in the film shifts from time to time, but his main goal is to find out what happened with Shasta Fey's new bow. He goes through a rabbit hole to learn of his whereabouts, but more importantly, he learns what happened to Shasta Fey herself. The point I'm trying to make is, Shasta might not be alive. Look at the evidence. Shasta is almost always seen in flashbacks, a time that was filled with dope and bliss. Early in the film, she visits him in the night, wearing clothes that she never thought he would wear and showing a bit more emotion than he was used to seeing. She exits the film and only reappears in flashbacks to help Doc complete his case. In the beginning of the film, Sorta Liege states, Back then it was always sandals, bottom half of a flower print bikini, and a faded Country Joe in the Fish t-shirt. When she finally returns to Doc at the very end of the film, guess what she's wearing? bottom half of a flower print bikini and a faded country joe in the fish t-shirt. Bigfoot makes note that she might be dead with his phone call to Doc early on in the film. Whew. I know she's gone. Sportello, she's gone. She has to fade up with. She's gone. Fuck you. 
Also, given her exploits, she's not ever seen talking to anyone else in the film, which is a bit telling, don't you think? She's not the only one who's dead either. You also have Coy Harlingen, who is dead in the not-so-literal sense, and you also have Bigfoot's partner, Indelicato, who is literally dead. Vincent Indelicato, otherwise known as Bigfoot's partner. To get right down to the nitty-gritty of the theory, I have to stress that I might be grasping at straws that aren't really there. The mirroring of Bigfoot and Doc is astonishing that by the end of the film, both characters seem to merge into one, further complicating things but also bringing Doc's hallucinations into play. If Doc is projecting onto Bigfoot or vice versa, then the possibility is open to project or hallucinate other characters in the inherent vice universe. In fact, we can go as far as saying Doc and the rest of the cast of colorful characters don't exist. Before we go any further, let's dive into the meaning of what Inherent Vice is. What's that? I don't know. In the film, it's described as... Inherent Vice in a marine insurance policy is anything that you can't avoid. According to the opening lines of Wikipedia, Inherent Vice is the deterioration of physical objects due to their inferior build and not by the interaction of any third party or outside action. This lends credit to Doc's mental breakdown or hallucinations due to his continued use of drugs and his spiral into the mourning the loss of a loved one. Let's start with denial, which is usually the first step in the Kubler-Ross model. In the film, Hope denies the loss of Koi, her junkie husband, and hires the help of Doc to prove her suspicions. Doc is very much in the same predicament as his client with Shasta. At the hearing that Shasta might be missing or dead based on Bigfoot's wordings, Doc denies such thing. Denial is the conscious or sometimes unconscious refusal to accept something as permanent as a death of a loved one or the loss of a relationship. Death cannot be avoided unless you're Rachel Ghoul. Take that, Batman. Doc doesn't do much denial, nor is there much denial seen in the film except for those scenes I mentioned, so let's move on. Anger, described by Kubler-Ross, can be manifested in various ways. Someone suffering from grief or mourning may be angry at their loss and may blame themselves for it. They could point their anger inward towards themselves or outward to those around them. Take Bigfoot Bjornsson as an example. Every scene Bigfoot is in, he's kicking Doc while he's down, slamming his fists against his desk in agitation, and yelling to get his point across. This next scene shows Bigfoot's gradual escalation from mild to anger in a matter of seconds. I mean, even the extra work is drying up. God help us all. The dentist on trampolines. Dr. Blatnoid had puncture wounds on his throat, consistent with bites from canines of a mid-sized wild animal. That's what the coroner told me. This is the most gradual climb to anger he takes, and one that is pent up from frustration. Doc's connection with Bjornsson at the end of the film is seen as projection, something touched on in the book. Since Doc is delusional and an unreliable narrator, come on, you have to know that he's imagining sort of Liege. How can we trust him and the story he's telling? We're getting glimpses of what's real and what's fictional, which reminds me of depression. Kubler-Ross states that depression is the state in which an individual may refuse to do the things they like. They stay quiet while they struggle with the loss of their loved one and the thought of their own mortality. However, according to the National Institute of Mental Health, there are five different types of depression. The one that Doc may be suffering from is psychotic depression. Psychotic depression occurs when an individual suffers from depression but also has an underlying form of psychosis such as hallucinating about what they hear and what they see. Typically a person suffering from this form of depression may have a recurring theme to their delusions like death or guilt. I don't need to say it again, do I? Doc throughout the film has been delusional, seeing and hearing things that aren't really there to a point where the line of normality and absurdity becomes blurred in the farcical world of Inherent Vice. No one really talks to Sordalige except for Doc, whom keeps lending help to him whenever he needs it. 
Before he gets the Chan of you estates, he's visited by Liege in the car who lists off other neighborhoods dozed down for the construction of large corporations. Mexican families bounced out of Chavez Ravine to build Dodger Stadium. American Indians swept out of Bunker Hill for the music center. And now Tariq's neighborhood bulldozed aside Channel View Estates. Blame this on the weed? Not likely. His depression theme is guilt, which I'll touch upon in a bit. Bargaining is the negotiation of an extended life for the person perished or a renewal of relationship, according to Kubler-Ross. Many people in this process would pray to a higher being to swap places with their loved one. Are you there, God? It's me, Giraffe. L listen, if you would just give me a mulligan on this quicksand thing, I promise. I promise. No more peeing on your shorter creatures. <laughs> what, did you get a deal? Or, as in the case of Robot Chicken, pray to become a better person. Doc does the same with Koi. Doc's journey takes him full circle to the client whom gave him his first paying job as a private investigator, Crocker Fenway, a lawyer representing those associated with the Golden Fang. By the end of the film, Doc possesses many a kilo of heroin and uses this bargaining chip for the life of Koi Harlingen, a trade Fenway is stunned to hear being made and one that is swiftly done in a matter of moments. Well, now how much money would I have to take from you so I wouldn't lose your respect? It's been late for that, Mr. Sportello. People like you lose all claim to respect the first time they pay anybody rent. Doc even writes Shasta's name in a joint he's about to smoke, a gesture expressed in the book that signifies a bargain for the safe return of the person being written. Now all this leads to acceptance. You know something? I'm cool with this. The final step in the Kubler-Ross model. Many overcoming this hurdle will sometimes embrace mortality for their loved one and for their own. Doc's depression in the film showed us he was actually suffering from guilt. In the beginning of the film, he's visited by Shasta in a button-down dress. She tells him about the plan to kidnap her new beau. Gentlemen of the straight world persuasion. When Doc dives deeper into the world of Michael Z. Wolfman, he comes to learn of his fetishes and his desires, all in the physical form of explicitly painted ties as well as the company he keeps. Technically Jewish, but wants to be a Nazi. So by the end of the film, when she returns, she describes to him the horrors of her relationship with Wolfman, describing everything he's done to her, as well as her being passed around and the damage she has as a result. My girlfriend had run off to be the bought and sold of her. Some scumbag developer. Just be so angry, I don't know what I'd do. For Doc and Shasta, sex is the ultimate acceptance. This doesn't mean we're back together. Or rather, that final scene of the film is the most telling. In the finale of the book, Doc is cruising through the fog in his car, yearning to find something new in the commotion of his case or in California altogether. Pinchon writes a bleak, ambiguous ending of Doc trying to find life again in the corrupt, discombobulated life in California. Remember, the Charles Manson murders occurred around this time in 1969, events mentioned in both the film and the book. In the film, Doc is driving with Shasta in tow, a less bleak but equally ambiguous ending to the madness Doc endured throughout the film. Him having sex with Shasta after her confession of what she went through with Wolfman is him coming to terms with his guilt about losing her and what happened to her. Him driving with her is his next step past grief. It could mean he died as a result of freeing Koi and bringing down the drug ring of the Golden Fang at the very end, but by the looks of it, he seems content with his choice. Oh, and a motif in the book is Atlantis, or just lost cities cleansed by the purification of water. See, Shasta says, Just us, together. Almost like being underwater. The world. Everything. Gone someplace else. Which could be an allusion to her own death. The same person swept away to a new world. So, yeah, that's my theory on Inherent Vice. Now, I I've seen Inherent Vice for, I don't know how many times, and uh, it was such a pleasure to rewatch it and rewatch it over again, and reading the book, I, I bought it after getting it from the library. Um, it's so good. Every time uh, I, I went back and started reading passages, and like the film, every time you reread, you get new stuff, you, you find new things. Um, so it was a blast to, to watch. I didn't like it at first, the, the movie, uh, but um, 
I persevered that first viewing and after watching it a second and a third time I came to realize that it was me, it was me who, who, who was wrong or that kind of sounds pretentious. A anyway, uh, Paul Thomas Anderson does these fantastic wonders um, in almost every scene of the film just trying to squeeze every bit of juice out of his actors and it's one of the better takes or, or one of one of the better uh, judgments on a director's part to just let the actor flow and uh, and every scene that he does this in it it transports you you kind of lean in closer to the screen and everything is almost in close-ups so it's kind of like this intimate conversation that maybe we shouldn't be here and, and Robert Elswood's cinematography is just so what's the word he, he kind of transports you to a world uh, to, to another world and one that I unfortunately was unable uh, to be a part of so I, I had a blast I have more videos like this coming very soon uh, including one that I'm looking at right over here uh, on to my right um, I don't want to spoil it yet uh, hopefully it comes out of me did you watch or read in Hair Advice? Leave your answer in the comment section below about what you think about it and what you think of my theory. If you want to support Lazy Dog Films, go ahead and visit the I in the corner of this video or visit the description below to visit LazyDogFilms.net to buy a t-shirt. How awesome is that? It's an awesome 50-50 blend. It feels so nice. It's double-sided. You get this awesome dog logo on the front. I'm working on other designs as well so if you want to pitch your other designs you can leave your answer in the section down below. Uh, if you want to support Legion Dog Films in other ways go ahead and click that like button and click that subscribe button for more videos especially that video I'm talking about coming next month. I'm looking at it right over here. So I've been Jonathan Silva and this has been Lazy Dog Films.